Hello, friends of the foundation. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host, and I'm here every week to, to welcome you to this show. And I'm a filmmaker and a writer. I've been working with CCF for almost 10 years. And we do lots of different video content, live video series like, like the one you're watching today, produce videos, patient-centric videos, treatment-centric videos, all with the same mission in mind, and that is to educate people and, and raise awareness about neuroendocrine tumors. So folks, uh, this is the beginning of the new year. New year, same show. We are back. Lots of new guests this season and some old favorites like the one we might have today. Uh, but if you're new to the show, I want to say welcome and uh, let us know where you're from. We like to see how far this program reaches. And if you are a regular, like I see some already in the chat box, you are doing that. Hello from Wisconsin. Hello from PA. Uh, yeah. Tell everybody where you're from. Inevitably, we have people all over the world tuning in live and uh, uh, we love to see it. That's what we're here to do. So before we get started, we always want to thank our sponsor, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support of Lunch with the Experts, we wouldn't be able to do the show. So Big thanks to them as always. And we always have this disclaimer from them, which is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay. Those, that was a lot of words in a little bit of time, but the takeaway is really that last line. We're going to give you some good answers to your questions. We're going to give you some good general advice, but we don't know your specific case. So by all means, take that advice, take those answers to your home team, which does, and make the best plan and path uh, forward for you because we all know that each case of this disease is very unique and therefore each path and plan forward is as well. So today our guest is Dr. Eric Mitra. I would love to welcome him back. He has been on the show before. He is a friend of the foundation. He is a friend of mine. Dr. Mitra, how are you? I'm great, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Good to see your face again. And uh, for those that aren't as familiar with your face, tell us a little bit about what you do in this neuroendocrine tumor community and world, where you work, what, uh, what you specialize in, and, and how they're going to get the most benefit out of this one-on-one uh, -on -one session with you today. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to thank the uh, CCF for having me back. It's uh, always a pleasure to, to work with you and um, it's always a fun experience, this, this particular live session. So thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for everyone who's joining in from around the country and around the world. It's really great to interact with you as well in this platform. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Dr. Eric Mitra. I'm a nuclear medicine physician. I work at Oregon Health and Science University. I'm the section chief of nuclear medicine and molecular imaging here. I've been here for about four years. And uh, prior to that, I was at Stanford University for almost 10 years um, working in the same capacity. I've been involved in, in the NET community for a long time as well. I participated in the, uh, the NETR1 trial, which of course led to the approval of Lutathera and have subsequently been involved in a number of uh, other trials as well. So yeah, um, a really always a, an enjoyable experience to participate in this and I look forward to the discussion. Awesome. And folks, uh, I have been to visit, visit also, you said Mitra. I've been saying Mitra. Am I pronouncing your last name wrong? Uh, either one is fine. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say uh, it? Honestly. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, I want to make sure. You say Mitra. It's fine. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna double check on that. Um, yeah. But folks, I've been to Dr. Mitra's um, hospital, OHSU, uh, before, and it is such a gorgeous campus. I mean, up on the hill. Mm -hmm. overlooking uh the city and they got they have this awesome little tram that takes you that takes you That's down right. right yeah that was re really cool and i have video footage from that it's just like so gorgeous so oh do you yeah 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 if you ever if folks if you ever have a chance to make it out there that is uh that's worth uh worth seeing itself um so Here's how we're going to take uh, take the show, folks that aren't familiar with how we do things here. Go ahead and start sending in your questions. Dr. Mitchard lets you know his specialty and where you're going to get the most benefit. We also want to get as many people here as possible. So if you know uh, someone who would benefit from this, this, a patient, a caregiver, whomever, go ahead and tag them in the comments. Let's get as many people here as possible because the real value is this one-on-one -on -one interactive session. Yes, you can always replay the video. It, it will, after we're done with the show, it will be posted here under the videos tab. Starting Monday, we'll republish it to YouTube so you can watch it and get a lot of value from it that way. 
But I know a lot of people out there that may be in places that don't have a net, uh, you know, specialty center. Uh, they may be struggling. They may be confused. Uh, so I really think that if people can get their questions asked and answered, which we do our best to do, that's going to be the most beneficial uh, for them. Uh, another thing I'd like to ask from you all that you do a very good job of every week is if you see a question in there in the comment section that you also have or you're also interested in, uh, you can like it right under the comment. You have the option to reply or like, and they give you other emojis you can use, but they all work effectively the same way for me. And it, it upvotes the question. It lets me see there's a demand for the question so uh, so I can make sure to get that one across. across. We get so many questions uh, sometimes yeah inevitably we don't get to them all so that, that helps me kind of like make sure i get the ones that are in high demand across to the guest all right that being said let's go ahead and start sending in those questions i see a lot are coming in already uh, i'm going to kick us off I, I i know we talk a lot about prrt on the show dr mentor i know a lot of people are going to be interested in learning about that about the netter one trial you had said something in your introduction about various other trials that you're a part of are you a part of any currently uh, or recently that, that you're excited about? Yes. Um, so there's so many developments that are going on in the world of PRT. Uh, again, for those who might not be familiar as much, the uh, Ludothera was a, is the only approved agent that we have for PRT currently, which was approved in January of 2018. So at this point, it's, it's four years um, old, so to speak. And uh, that gives us a lot of experience with it in the in the past, but really it's just the beginning. There's so many different ways that it's uh, going to be developing in the future, and there's so many clinical trials that are um, that are opening up. Um, we are particularly involved in and excited about some of the developments that are happening with different radioisotopes. So uh, again, for everyone's um, information, the Lutathera that's currently available is using Lutetia 177, which is a, what's called a beta minus uh, radio pharmaceutical. And it's what's most commonly used for most types of radio pharmaceutical therapies that we use, not just for NETS, but across, across the board. Uh, one of the big interesting uh, developments is happening in the world of um, alpha therapies. And so that's a much more kind of powerful isotope compared to the uh, beta particles. Uh, so we are uh, looking forward to opening that trial later this year. There's also a whole host of other trials that are just looking at you know, when should we, when should we deploy PRRT? Is it um, the first thing that should be used? Is it should be used later on? Should you consider even using it a uh, second round for those, mm -hmm. those people who have done well with it the first time? Um, so yeah, we can, we can talk about these in, in more detail, but there's uh, just, you know, everyone should know that there's a number of different trials that are starting out. Yeah, all those questions you just mentioned, the sequencing, et, et cetera, the second round, like these, these, these topics come, come yeah. these topics come up so often on the show. So I'm sure that we'll we'll talk about that again today. And I know that they're currently under under a lot of a uh, lot of discussion, as you alluded to. Uh, but Dr. Mitchell, we have a lot of questions already rolling in. People are excited about this show. The numbers are looking great. We're going to go ahead and start taking some from the question. The first one comes from Florian, our friend from Germany. It says, are there any scans for patients without somatoset? somatostatin receptors uh or are there any in the pipeline <clears throat> so um yeah so again just to back up for a second most neuroendocrine uh, patients especially who are low grade or intermediate grade express somatostatin receptors and that's become the foundation of imaging for patients with neuroendocrine tumors both at, at diagnosis um restaging evaluation of uh, response, uh, even to some, to some degree. Um, so some certain patients, if you have higher grade disease or in a very rare uh, situation, if you even have low grade or intermediate grade disease and don't express somatostatin receptors, then the most common imaging modality to use in that situation is typically our standard FDG PET scan, which is a glucose analog. And that typically allows us to uh, evaluate the, the disease. And if that also doesn't work, then we have to rely on conventional imaging such as, such as CT and uh, MR, which already we use as, as a foundational imaging uh, for all, all patients, even if they express the statin receptors. But that would be, you know, I think the, the only um, option in that case. Got it. Thanks, Florian. Uh, good to see your name, my friend. Uh, I have a question from Merlin. Merlin, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Can a radiologist tell from an MRI or CT images if a net has died? I'm not exactly sure what uh, 
what they're meaning there, but maybe you are. Yeah, so actually that's a, that's a good question because um, conventional imaging, again, CT and MRI is all based on uh, anatomy primarily. So we can see where the lesions are, but I think what the question is getting at is, is that lesion that we can see on conventional imaging active or has it actually been treated and mm -hmm. um, has sort of died or become necrotic? Um, and that's a, that's a really good, good point because um, things that uh, are not necessarily active are not something that you would necessarily need to really treat. Um, that mm -hmm. is generally speaking where functional imaging with PET um, and dotate or FDG those things really kind of come into play because we can actually see what cells are doing um, in terms of the expression of those receptors. So if a cell has died, it's not going to necessarily express those, those things anymore. So that would be, um, I think, the main way. So the, the real answer to that question, I think, is that it's very challenging on conventional imaging, uh, but using some of these other functional modalities might help us. Got it. Thanks so much. And a uh, great question. Uh, and I get to learn something new, new there as well. I haven't heard it worded that way. Uh, Ursula says, is it better to have breakfast before having blood work such as chromogranin A tested? And a few other people were curious about this as well. So I'm not the best person to answer that question. Um, as a newcomer, as a physician, we don't typically uh, evaluate those types of labs. So I would, I would defer that question probably to a oncologist or an endocrinologist. Got it. Uh, another good question um, from Merlin. It says, how quickly will a, a bland embolization kill nets? So um, radio embolization procedures uh, for everyone's uh, information is targeted uh, delivery of different types of uh, beads to <clears throat> the uh, liver tumors directly uh, by the hep hepatic arteries. Um, and there's very various different ways to approach those, either blind embolization, as was mentioned, or uh, if you actually have chemotherapy within those beads, that's chemoembolization, or if you have radi radiation within those beads, then that's radi radio embolization. So all of those work quite effectively and in a, uh, typically in a very short time frame. In fact, that's one of the, the advantages to embolization procedures over some of the other systemic agents that we have, whether they're chemotherapy or whether they're PRRT, is they tend to, to work uh, a little bit quicker and more effectively in the short term. That's a different kind of thing than you know, long-term control necessarily. And it's also a different thing than uh, toxicity can be sometimes a um, issue for embolization procedures. But yeah, though that is one of the things that we um, talk about for that in tumor boards is if we want really immediate control. All right. Thank you. Folks, if you're just joining us or you joined us a little bit late, this is Luncheon with the Experts of Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program. Today, we're with, we are with Dr. Eric Mitra from OHSU. We're talking about all things imaging, uh, PRT, radiology, and I also want to commend our guest on his beautiful background, uh, well-lit set. I'm very impressed. Looks so good, so professional. We're happy to have him back on the show. We are going to keep taking questions because you guys have a lot of them. Uh, Suzanne says, I had carcinoid tumors found accidentally in my appendix, which I know happens often in 2004 during a hysterectomy and no clean margin. So I had a right hemiocolectomy um, and was told uh, I was clear and cured. Now I believe that I have carcinoid syndrome. 5-HIAA was markedly or was marked rather elevated in tumor marker 279, but dotate PET scan last week was negative. Could I still have a re recurrence of carcinoid? Yeah, great question. Um, so tumor markers such as 5-HIAA and others are certainly very sensitive, but they're not necessarily very specific. So um, for that reason, you know, what you've had done with the dotate scan and potentially you've had some other imaging as well uh, with CT or MRI, I think those are absolutely the right things to do to try to evaluate those things. Dotate PET as sensitive as it is, is not perfect. You know, everything has a certain resolution limit in terms of what it can evaluate. Every, every single imaging modality has that issue. Um, so I would say that the answer to your question is yes, if you do have, you know, elevated uh, tumor markers and imaging has been negative, that doesn't entirely 100% exclude that you don't have that. So I think it would, it's a matter of what we often do in that situation is continue to, to just follow. It likely indicates that whatever is um, 
expressing that is very small. So that's a good thing. It probably doesn't indicate um, you know, a need for urgent intervention. Um, so continuing to follow it, and then perhaps in a future scan, we'll be able to identify where it's coming from. Got it. I have a question about uh, symptoms um, from Beth. Let's see how, how uh, you feel about this. My mother had, or with mid-gut neuroendocrine cancer has a lot of dizziness and low blood pressure. For, uh, to your knowledge, is that a common type of carcinoid syndrome in patients? It's not a common type of um, okay. symptom, uh, certainly. But again, the carcinoid syndrome can be quite uh, variable in different patients. And we see the same thing for some of the side effects from PRT. You know, we have our common ones and, and then uncommon ones as well. So um, again, I wouldn't exclude that it's, it's a possibility, but uh, other uh, etiologies for that should also be considered. Got it. Next question, what happens to the resin beads that are injected with embolization procedures? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, Again, I'm going to have to defer that one because as that's so those procedures are done by interventional radiologists. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be the best person to do. But my, my guess would be that they essentially um, degrade over time uh, and are taken up by the macrophage system within the body. Got it. I have a PRT question from Gretchen, which I know we've already kind of been talking about a bit. She says, I am currently on PRT therapy uh, due to a platelet count, I can only do half of the normal dose. Do you find this to be effective? Is this typical? Right. So a uh, couple of points there. One is that platelet issues related to PRT, although uncommon, are the most common side effect that we typically are seeing. So that is something that is at least expected to some degree. Um, and then the standard protocol for that, according to the package insert for Ludothera and our general understanding is to do exactly what is happening for you is to give half a dose. Also, we sometimes um, extend the timing between the cycles of the therapy, all in the hopes that the, your body will recover and the platelets will get, get back to normal. So that is uh, you know, absolutely the, the right thing to do. There's not much else that you can do uh, practically, because what we would like to do is to continue the therapy. If you delay it too much, then you know the tumors may have a chance to start regrowing again, and you've sort of lost the ground that you've gained from the prior cycles of the therapy. Um, so yeah, that is that is the normal strategy. Um, and if your platelet is recovered, then we can come back come back to a normal uh, dosing of two hundred millicuries. And if it doesn't recover, then most people would stop at that point. Got it. Hey, thanks for your question, Gretchen. Um, Dr. Mitchell, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, alpha therapy. And so Merlin asked, are you aware of any alpha PRT trials available for patients who have already had Lutathera? Yes. Uh, so that's the trial that is um, okay. opening probably for at our institution and probably most institutions that will start later this uh, spring or maybe into the summer. And the way that the trial is designed is for patients who may have already had PRRT, which okay. makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. uh, you know that's probably the largest cohort of, uh, of patients that are going to need it. I believe it's also open for patients who have may have received other types of therapy as well and are, are beginning to progress. But um, the other thing I would say about alpha therapies in general that comes from a lot of the, the clinical trials that have already been done in Europe and uh, in Australia, not just for NETS, but also for other cancer types, such as prostate cancer, is that, is that we believe that that's even normally how we're going to use it in the future, is we'll start with the beta therapies, because that's kind of the standard of care. And then when you progress, then you can go on to the alpha therapies, because again, they're, they're um, meant or thought to be much more effective than the beta therapies. Uh, best place for people to learn more about that trial? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's still so early on right now that it's um, there's not a lot of information okay. on it. Um, people can go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is uh, the, the resource for all clinical trials that are available. And there's good search engines on there to, to look for these things. Some of it might be a little bit detailed uh, uh, for most patients to look through, but I, I would refer patients to that as sort of the, the and, main thing. And would they have something like this that's not quite available yet? Like, do they have like a pre, you know, a pre-category? Yeah, 
Yes, uh, as okay. as soon as a, a trial is um, established, then they'll list it on clinicaltrials.gov whether or not it's open to recruitment yet or not. So so you can kind of see you know what things, but you can actually search for for things that are open versus yeah. not open. Yeah, that might be the you. most helpful. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of trials that are not yet open. Sometimes it just depends on what trial it is, but sometimes it will never open, you know, just listed there. Sure, sure. And folks, I, we did a video on clinical trials a while back, maybe a year or two ago. I'd suggest che checking that out under our videos tab or on the YouTube channel. But uh, I'll say that that site can can be daunting to some. But what I find to be the two most effective approaches is, is like Dr. Mitra said, using the search bar. And then also they have a map feature, uh, so you can look geographically. You can uh, check out where, where you know where you are and see if there's any trials there. But it's, it's a lot of content on there, so I would definitely utilize that uh, that search bar as well. Yeah, I would take it a little bit with a grain of salt, like like you're saying, and then ultimately ultimately talk to your oncologist or your, you your primary physician. That's always, I think, the best resource for you. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, folks, as always, if uh, if we find out any any information, we will update you here at the foundation. Uh, okay, moving on. Next question from Kate. I have my gallbladder removed and I'm on lanreotide on the 25th, having more surgery on my cancer in my small intestine. Would it be difficult to check a spot on my liver that has been there for over three years? Or I guess the question would be like, how, you know, how how would she go about that the best way? So I'm guessing based on the question that it's it's talking about during the process of the surgery to evaluate that uh, liver lesion. Okay, while yeah, while they're in there. While they're in there, right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, the other aspect of that that I'm not entirely sure is whether that's a laparoscopic surgery that she's having done or whether it's an open surgery. If it's an open surgery, it's definitely, I think, uh, quite easy to evaluate that, especially okay. if it's along the the surface of the liver. Mm -hmm. If it's a laparoscopic surgery, then it's a, then it's much more difficult to do that. And and again, it depends on where it's located sure. in the liver. Also, I'm not sure the the size and so forth. Um, I'm sure that's already being evaluated with an MRI or um, or Dota Tate PET. That would be the other way. Gotcha. Well, uh, hopefully that helped answer your question, Kate. But as always, for you and anyone else listening, if if, if you have follow up questions. You know, let us know if you're still uh, on the show, if you're still on the broadcast, you can chime in later or give us a little bit more information for clarity. And then if not, if you had to go away or if it's toward the end of the, end of the show, I always encourage you to reach out to CCF with follow up questions or if you didn't get your question answered. And, and I can promise you they'll do everything they can to, to get you that information. That is our job here at the foundation. Um, let's see. OK. How many Dotatate PET scans will health insurance pay for for a patient? I'm sure this varies, but um, any thoughts on that or knowledge on that? Yeah, uh, some. Uh, number one is exactly what you said, Rain. That it is, it varies. Uh, it varies by your the specific insurance. It varies by the the um, place where you're getting it done. It varies by the oncologist or your primary physician's ability to advocate for you and. Um, recommend that you get it done. For my own patients or patients at, at my institution, I've seen a huge amount of variability there. Some patients are able to get them within every few months and other patients um, at the other, other end of the extreme is only once a year. But it does definitely depend on what's going on with you and, and why the need for that PET scan. So yeah, there's a lot of variability, there, but the average answer I would say is probably every six months or so. Got it. Uh, back to PRRT. Donna says, what are some, some of the common long-term side effects after four treatments of PRRT? I finished last uh, the last treatment 10 months ago, and I'm still having pain from peripheral neuralgia. So um, the, I can speak to the published data on that, as well as our own experience in, in uh, hundreds of patients who have received it. And I would say there's actually very limited long-term toxicity. The main thing that we worry about, um, and again, this comes from the published data, is actually the bone marrow toxicity. I was mentioned before about the platelets dropping as, a, as being rare, but a common right. um, occurrence within that. And so from there, you can have kind of long-term uh, issues with that. Most of the people who have that are typically those who have already been pretreated with other types of agents in the past and then received PRRT or vice versa, they received PRRT and then subsequently had um, many other types of 
therapy, not PRT alone typically doesn't uh, result in that. But in terms of those types of symptoms that she's talking about, those are very rare, uh, both, both in terms of the published data as well as in our experience. Most people, if anything, have kind of symptoms during the uh, course of the therapy. Even then, that's rare. Um, and then doesn't really last after that. Got it. Uh, so uh, I figured this would be the case that we have several PRRT questions, which I know that you are okay with. So we'll, we'll stay in this, uh, in this zone okay. for a little while. Bess yeah. says, uh, please speak to the effectiveness of PRRT with cutaneous metastasis of, uh, of a net. Wow. Uh, that's a really interesting question. I cannot speak to it because <laughs> uh, I have no experience with that, actually. I can just only mentioned that generically speaking, the nice thing about all of all of systemic therapies and PRT being a perfect example of that is that it will go to wherever there is a blood supply and somatostatin receptor expression. Those are the only two things you need. So if on your on your DOTA tape PET scan, if those cutaneous lesions showed up, then it will be treated with the PRT as well. How effective uh, that uniquely that will be to the cutaneous lesions, that's the part that I don't know because uh, mm -hmm. I'm not aware of that data and don't have any patients with that, but it, it should in theory be treated. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. thanks. Uh, I think you still bring a lot of value, even, even if it's something like that, that, that you can't necessarily speak to. So I, pre I appreciate that very much. I know the, um, the uh, people in the audience do as well. Um, Beth says, how often do you suggest PRT for patients with a lot of liver tumors? If the patient already did a series of PRT a few years ago, so how often do you suggest what sounds like a second round? For, of course, someone who has a lot of liver tumors. Yeah, a lot of liver tumors. If the patient already did a ser did the series, the series, so I'm assuming four of PRT a few years ago. Yeah. So in our uh, neuroendocrine tumor board, the main thing that we generally discuss for patients who have a lot of liver disease, and of course, that's a very common thing for patients with NETS, um, is the is the sequencing between PRT versus liver directed therapy? So we were talking about the radioembolization options that that were there before. Um, so those are best suited for patients who have liver dominant disease or or even liver only disease would be even better for that. And we always kind of go back and forth between those two options. Uh, we generally try to stay away from radioembolization. So the uh, the yttrium ninety microspheres that are used for the embolization procedures just because the uh, relative um, efficacy between those different embolization procedures is not necessarily so clear. So they all seem to work pretty well, as I, as I mentioned before. So we'd rather not have the radiation from the Y90 plus the radiation from the PRT kind of competing with each other and causing potential, potentially more toxicity when we can use blind embolization or chemoembolization instead. Uh, so that's one comment. Um, but I think the more challenging one that we struggle with is which one to use first. And this goes to the sequencing question uh, among many, many therapies. Should a patient who primarily only has liver disease first get the embolization procedures and then subsequently get PRT or the reverse? And honestly, no one knows the answer to that question. So we sort of uh, take it on a patient by patient basis if they happen to have already come from somewhere there where they've already been treated with embolization then we'll of course move to PRT next um, and vice versa as far as retreatment goes with um, PRT uh, for patient with who has liver dominant disease I would be I guess a little bit hesitant if you haven't already had this might be a good one for a follow-up if um, she's still there if um, if you haven't had embolization I would rather go to that next rather than retreatment for a variety of reasons we can talk about. But if you already have had that or embolization is no longer a good option for you, mm -hmm. then retreatment with PRT is very reasonable. Got it. Hey, Beth, if you are still around, you chime back in and just um, because we get so many comments over there, just um, clarify like what your previous question was, if you can just, you know, uh, uh, briefly, you know, I'll, I'll remember it, but that just helps me um, if you do chime back in. But thanks for your question. Uh, still in the PRRT world, Sarah says, how long does PRRT typically work for? Again, I'm sure this this varies, but, you know, she's 15 months out uh, from finishing it and so far stable. So that's good news. Is there any data that you have about uh, how long it typically, you know, works? 
I mean, that was essentially the you know, point of for many of the clinical trials that led to the approval of PRT. So if we look at the, the NETR1 data um, being the main one there, we're looking at quite a long, what we call progression-free survival period of approximately 30 to, to even 40 months. If you look at some of the um, other data that's out there, so that's sort of the the range that we're looking for. But absolutely, you know, every person is very different, so that's very much just an average, and uh, just depends on on your specific tumors and how they're responding. I get a, a question from many of my patients about, you know, is there, is there are there things that they can do to kind of help prolong that period. And you know, my answer is really, unfortunately, not. You know, it is just the just the biology of the of your body and how it responds to PRRT. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Got it. Got it. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Um, Ursula, our friend from South Africa, right? Ursula, I think that's where you're from. Uh, says after four rounds of PRRT, my blood platelets were for the first time since um, diagnosis uh, in the normal range. And the diagnosis was back in 2020. I've had my fifth round, uh, December 2021, so very recently, and I'll have my last round in February. Now, honestly, feeling good, was not sure whether I should go ahead with five and six remaining positive. Is there anyone that has had six rounds in the in the span in the span of a year? Is is ultimately the question? Is there anything to be worried about there? Is that a good you know? Yeah, um, good good question. So. You know, the, the standard dosing for Lutathera for everyone's information is four cycles right. of the therapy, usually given every two months apart, as long as there aren't any issues with, with their uh, blood labs or platelets <laughs> or anything like that. Um, but there's a huge amount of discussion in the field. This is another area of ongoing research or whether or not we, can, we should give additional cycles of the therapy or the opposite too. C certain patients may not even need the four cycles. They might only need... Um, a few cycles and then they should stop. There's not a lot of data uh, that's out there. There are patients who have been continued on treatment with um, the full dose of 200 millicuries uh, beyond the, the four cycles, continuing on the, on the same um, range of every two months. And um, my understanding is that they have done well. I, I would say that it's a, it's a little bit of an unknown, but as long as, again, all your labs are fine, which I think was mentioned that they are, and you're feeling well. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule to say you shouldn't uh, do that. But equally, this is something that should be very much uh, discussed as to you know what the utility of those additional cycles would be, because the standard is is not that. Um, it's a little bit hard to answer in the U.S. Uh, right. Because we're a lot more limited than than the rest of the world is and they, they definitely are uh, um, another area we can discuss potentially if there are any questions on it is about personalized dosimetry for prt and i know that a lot of places around the world are using that to help determine exactly these questions of how many cycles and what's the total cumulative dose of prt that should be received got it thanks ursula um Next question from Ruby. Does radioembolization to the liver pre prevent any future treatment to that organ? A few other people have this. So this is um, kind of what I was alluding to before. The main one that is thought to maybe have a factor mm -hmm. at all, and even then it's a soft thing, is, is that relationship between radioembolization versus PRT because they're both different ways of delivering radiation to those liver tumors. So if there is some toxicity from the radioembolization, then would that potentially be worsened by the PRRT or, or vice versa? That's the only one that um, we discussed. There is no data to necessarily say one way or the other. It's one of those things among several other examples that we can talk about in the net world where we do things just based on these types of thought processes, uh, but without a lot of hard, hard data to support it. Got it. Thanks, Ruby. Selvi says, I've gone through two rounds of PRT and there's been no noticeable improvement in symptoms. I'm a recurrent uh, PGL, which is paraganglioma, right? Uh, with an extensive bone and organ metastases. What are my options at this point? Can you repeat that? So, sure. how many cycles of two rounds of PRT, but there, at this point, there have been no noticeable improvements in symptoms. Mm hmm. Re so 
so a little bit like um, we were talking about for the earlier question is that as long as, you know, again, there's no clear data on exactly how many uh, cycles to truly give. Um, but as we were mentioning that if the labs are fine and overall, you know, there's not a worsening of uh, symptoms. You didn't mention that there was a progression of disease. It's just kind of stable disease. I would advocate that you continue to receive the four cycles of the Lutathera because every cumulative dose that you give is a chance for that tumor to be more affected by that radiation, which is what we are looking for. So as long as, if that makes sense, as long as there aren't any, any red flags to stop, I would just continue at least for four cycles. Beyond that, uh, I don't really know. We have treated several patients with uh, PPGL and I will say that they um, all have actually done pretty well okay. for what that's uh, worth. This is um, you know, something that is yet another area that people are doing a lot of research in. There's a large trial going on at the NIH for this specific reason uh, and we don't have a lot of data on that yet, but it certainly makes sense that anything that shows up as having high expression on a Dota tape PET scan, and a lot of patients with PPGL do have that, would would have a, a benefit from that treatment. I, I again, this is maybe a follow up uh, for her, but uh, you know, I don't know what her Dota tape expression was on her PET scan. It seems to be, you know, a couple of times uh, you've mentioned uh, the trials coming up, a lot of the research that's going on. Do you feel like we're kind of, you know, I talked to a lot of the doctors and we, you and I may have mentioned it before on the show about the, the leaps and bounds we've made for, you know, in the past 10 years, right? There's a lot that happened, including that are one in 2018 uh, approval PRT in the States, but, but lots have happened in, in those, those 10 years. And just hearing you talk about the, you know, all the research that's going on now, do you feel like, you know, we're, we're maybe entering this new stage where a lot of new developments will be happening. It seems there's a lot of activity going on from my perspective. Would you say that's true? I think so. I think so. Um, it, I would say that we're still kind of in the middle of it. Right. You know, I feel like these trials are, are ongoing. Um, I think probably it's just a, a guess, but I think in the next probably five years, we're going to yeah. see a lot of those uh, study results coming out. Mm -hmm. I would love to see some expansion in, in the uh, um, indications for PRT, for instance. I would love to see some data on um, you know, the effects of dosimetry and whether we should start doing more personalized uh, dosing and different numbers of cycles, um, all of these things. But I think it's probably, uh, probably a few more years out. You, you, know, you had mentioned personalized dosimetry a, little, a, a moment ago. What can you tell us more, more about that? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. So, um, you know, the approval for PRTs I've mentioned a few times is a standard dose of 200 millicuries for four cycles. The only deviation to that that we're essentially allowed to make is if there is toxicity in the bone marrow or other things, then we okay. could reduce one of the cycles to 100 millicuries. That's incredibly limiting, I feel like. And if you kind of look at it from the, you know, a thousand foot view, does it make sense that all different patients of all different sizes and tumor burden and different expression of somatostatin receptor and different areas that are involved would all be effectively treated with, with just that standard dosing of 200 millicuries? It's possible. And certainly the results of the another one trial would suggest that, you know, we are getting favorable results, which is why that was what was approved. But I mean, I think you can tell from my tone that I feel like you know, there's more that we can we can do in terms of personalization, and that's where this dosimetry uh, aspect comes in. Is that we would actually calculate, you know, what the delivery of the radiation is to your specific tumors, and also what the safety limit is for your specific organs, right. and then calculate what your specific dose should be for every single cycle, as well as what the cumulative dose should be. So back to, you know, some patients may need less than four cycles, some patients may need more than four cycles, and we would potentially have that. But I do want to just caution everyone that although all of this sounds um, great in theory, it's incredibly challenging in practice, which is why it hasn't really taken sure. off yet even to do those dosimetry scans, which is basically multiple scans after you get the therapy done. It's time consuming, um, it's costly, 
it requires a medical physicist to be able to do all of the calculations that are required of that at a high level. It requires good software to be able to do that, which a lot of institutions don't have. And the biggest downside or challenge, I should say, is that even if you calculate all of those things, for instance, in a research trial, what really needs to be shown is does modulating those doses on a patient specific way really lead to changes in outcomes, both in terms of improved efficacy and reduced toxicity. So that really needs a clinical trial to be able to show those outcomes. And then, you know, potentially insurance will, would approve those types of changes. So I, I, I do feel that things are moving that way. There's more and more, um, more and more um, hospitals. You, some of the patients who are on this uh, call might recognize that some of the patients may have even gone through some dosimetry, but it's by far not a universal standard right now. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for taking a moment uh, on that. We'll get back to some questions. Dwayne says, what's the best imaging or procedure to ob obtain size of PNET? Size um, is typically best evaluated with conventional imaging and specifically uh, for a pancreas, the um, advocated modalities are triple phase CT. Triple phase meaning the um, contrast is, is what I'm talking about, looking at the different phases of the contrast or uh, multi-phase MRI. Those are probably the best to look at actual sizes of tumors, whether that's in the pancreas or also within the liver. Got it. Uh, Merlin, uh, who has been chiming in quite a bit today, so we appreciate you. And again, please make uh, sure that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You can you can spell it out phonetically for me if I'm not. Uh, uh, the, let's see. The question is, all right, my KI-67 has increased from 3.5% to 14% over the past 10 years. How will that affect my net receptor activity and treatment options not involving receptors? Great question. Uh, Merlin has a lot of good questions. So totally. um, yeah. Um, so what we're talking about here is the, the grade of the tumor and, and uh, that is what defines whether you're low grade, intermediate grade or high grade. And those classifications then subsequently affect what type of treatment options that you have. I will say that lo um, low grade, which is zero to 3% and then intermediate grade, which is three to 20%. Both of those are considered essentially within the same category as far as treatment options go. So generally speaking, the uh, answer there would be that it, it shouldn't really affect what the treatment options are. But he did ask a, a good kind of subset question to that is how that will affect the somatostatin receptor expression. As the grade continues to increase, the somatostatin receptor expression goes down over time. This is what I was referring to uh, early on when there was a question about um, if you don't have somatostatin receptor expression, then you would need, need to move to FDG imaging, for instance. Um, so if, if um, the dotatate scans that are now being done and the grade has increased to 14%, I would think it's unlikely, but it may show less somatostatin rece receptor expression. Mm -hmm. And the main treatment options that would affect are any type of PRRT and potentially also uh, somatostatin analogs. Got it. So Dr. Mitra, uh, I've mentioned this to you before. You can tell by the questions from the audience, like uh, people like Merlin, you know, a lot of our attendees are very well educated. They ask very thought provoking you know, questions, very great, yeah. you know, good questions. But we also every week we get new people to this um, this journey, this disease, this show. And so I also like to, to 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 play to them as well, because, as you know, I mean, if you're early into this, it can be confusing and scary to a lot of people. So I want to back up, you know, a little bit. Uh, we have a guest that joined us. Leslie, who is new to the show and new to the, the carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumor community. Uh, I will say, Leslie, lean into it. The people will take care of you. They will support you. That means our doctors and our experts and our patients and caregivers and support uh, support group leaders. This is a very, very powerful and very uh, helpful and therefore valuable community. But welcome to the show. And Leslie asked, what exactly is PRRT? I'm on Sandostatin injections monthly. Uh, so we've talked about PRRT so much today. Can we go back to just like square one and just on the on the fifth grade level, like explain what exactly happens with this therapy and, and why it's been uh, uh, effective in a lot of cases? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Yes, you're absolutely right that we sometimes dive into uh, yeah. a lot of uh, detail and, and we should take a step back. 
So PRT stands for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, which if you break down those terms make um, a lot of sense because, because what we're doing is your, your um, tumors, and, and this, again, we were talking about those that are kind of on the lower grade spectrum, always express the somatostatin receptors because somatostatin is a hormone which, which neuroendocrine cells use to communicate uh, between themselves. And so they have to have these receptors to be able to have that communication. And so PRT, as well as somatostatin analog therapy alone, uses that idea of these somatostatin receptors and binding to those receptors to then uh, cause the efficacy of their treatment. So somatostatin analogs, just by binding those receptors and blocking those receptors alone can cause a huge improvement in symptoms from carcinoid syndrome, but they can also prevent some of the tumors from growing as well, that's been shown. And then PRT takes it to the next level by using those same somatostatin analogs, but then attaching a radiopharmaceutical to it Typically, we had talked about that this Lutetia-177, which gives off this type of radiation called uh, beta-minus, uh, but also in the future, we're excited about other types of radioisotopes, such as alpha particles. But either way, what it does is that somatostatin analog binds to the somatostatin receptor, which as we talked about is already helpful. And then it, in addition to that, it gives off radiation locally, and that radiation then typically causes uh, DNA damage within that cell, and that DNA damage can't be repaired, and so then that cell can't continue to grow, and that's the main thing that we're trying to do with that. So this has been looked at for um, patients with NETS for over 20 years, so it's a very old therapy in a way, but it was only approved in the U.S., um, as a result of this large um, phase three clinical trial, NETR1 in 2018. Mm -hmm. And it's really been very, very effective for patients who, um, who have sufficient expression of uh, somatostatin receptors. Um, and that goes back to the uh, imaging. So you have to have a dotatate PET scan to confirm expression of those somatostatin receptors. And if you have that, then you're be a great candidate for PRRT. Got it. Hey, thanks for taking the time to do that. And Leslie, again, I want to say welcome. I appreciate you being here at the show. We're here every week, every Thursday. Um, and if you didn't catch my intro in the beginning, uh, my name is Rain Bennett, and I'm a, a filmmaker, and I've been working with CCF for 10 years to, to create video content about this, uh, this disease. So when I tell you that we have a library for you, I mean it. So um, when you have time, there is a plethora of great information that we have available either on here on the Facebook page uh, under the videos tab or at our YouTube channel. It's a lot of videos. I've been working with ECF for a decade, so <laughs> there's quite a bit, but but very, very helpful. For, so thanks again and really uh, join as often as you can on Thursdays because always great questions will come from the audience and then you can continue to ask yours as well. All right, folks, we got just about 10 minutes left. Still got questions, so we're going to keep moving on. Uh, Marnie says, uh, are there embolization treatments available for pancreatic nets? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, pancreatic nets is typically treated surgically, if possible, not always possible, depending on the uh, size of the tumor and the lo local involvement um, from things. But embolization procedures are, for the most part, just reserved for liver tumors. Got it. Yeah. Uh, okay, and this is a callback to what we mentioned earlier about the, the length of how long PT, PR, PRRT works. Allison says, we mentioned PRRT working for 30 to 40 months. Uh, once the 30 to 40 months is up, is there another type of treatment that can or should be tried other than PRRT at, at that point? Yeah. So that relates again to the grade of the tumor. If yeah. you have a lower grade tumor, then um, a common therapeutic option is Everlimus. If you have higher grade tumors, then uh, common therapeutic options are uh, capsidabine and temozolomide. So these are other systemic therapies as well. And uh, certainly there also can be quite effective if you have um, also liver dominant disease or liver only disease, as we mentioned before, then that's where radioembolization procedures go. So that's kind of the whole idea of not only uh, cancer treatment for NETS, but also for many other types of cancers as well, is just to move from one option to another. The other thing that I think this question is a perfect prelude to is talking about repeat PRT that we you know, talked about briefly before. So there are, have been and are ongoing clinical trials looking at 
um, how effective that is to repeat PRRT. The biggest caveat there that patients should be aware of is that it's only indicated for patients who did have a very good response the first time around. So if you truly did have 30 to 40 months of progression-free survival, that would be a potentially a perfect candidate to repeat the PRRT. The clinical trials so far seem to show that it works again quite well. Of course, again, with the caveat that you would have to have a repeat uh, DOTA-T PET scan, confirm that you still have DOTA-T uh, receptor expression. If you do, then it tends to be effective, usually not quite as effective as the first round of it, which you know essentially makes sense, I think, when you're just repeating the same treatment, but still quite effective with low toxicity. The big problem in the US is, uh, again, insurance. You know, it's This is not something that's standard of care yet by any means. Um, we Every, every uh, hospital in the country is actually facing this right now because all those patients that were treated initially in 2018 and then went through all four cycles, had a good PFS period, that's right now. So uh, I think most hospitals are trying to figure out how, how to do that. We, we ourselves have uh, four patients that we're waiting to repeat that uh, on. So I think we're gonna see, back to Rain, what you said about you know, when are we going to see some of these, um, re, you know, changes actually yeah. happening? I think in the next few years, probably we'll see. Yeah. Well, that attracts, that makes sense with like, cause what I was asking is it seems yeah. to be a lot of, uh, research and things going on right now. So that, that makes sense that in the next couple of years, the, uh, we impact don't. or the effects of that research will, will, you know, reveal or manifest or whatever. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll be exciting news. Um, Rebecca says, what are the pros and cons of doing PRRT versus debulking tumor bird? Um, so I would say the answer to that is that generally speaking, both at the, at the very beginning of diagnosis and, and later on, surgery is always considered to be a very good option if you're a good surgical candidate for it by which I mean both in terms of other medical issues that you might have, but also in terms of how much of the disease that can be removed. Debulking is uh, very, very effective if you can remove a large amount of the tumor uh, that's within a certain organ. For instance, in the liver, common uh, numbers that are used are 70% or 90% debulking, and then that's shown to have a, a, a good outcome. What, Relative to the PRT, that's a very difficult question to answer because usually PRT is considered for patients who aren't able to go through surgery in that fashion, either because you're not able to have a significant debulking or you have other comorbidities that prevent you from, from going through such an extensive surgery. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah, that's a little bit difficult question to answer. You just have to kind of um, base everything. One thing that I want to just make sure that everyone uh, hears about, I'm sure they've heard about it from other, um, other luncheons as well, is that all of these decisions that we're talking about should ideally be made in the context of a multidisciplinary tumor board. Because, you know, as we've been talking about, the surgeon has to have their input, the radiation oncologist has to have their input, the interventional radiologist, the radiologist, um, the pathologist, all of them. So if you are in an institution that has that, that's the ideal way to, to make these decisions, not in isolation. And um, nowadays with our virtual world that we're living in, even uh, oncologists who are in institutions that don't have access to a neuroendocrine tumor board um, can now. We just, I just had a, a, um, one of our oncologists joined at our tumor board this past Tuesday uh, from Montana. And, you know, we're in Portland and, they, you know, we discuss the, their patient's care um, that way. So I just want to make sure that everybody is, is aware of that importance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have a question from Barbara and many other people. And I, I know that uh, these questions come up a lot when talking to experts as yourself. Barbara says, I'm always concerned about the amount of radiation I get from the yearly CT scans. I was diagnosed in 2012, so I've already had at least a dozen and will likely get these every year in the future. Does this put me at risk for other cancers from the radiation or has this scan improved in terms of radiation exposure? So I shouldn't be concerned about this. Let's dive into it with a few minutes left. Sure. Yeah. So the, so the answer is yes and yes. Yes, that any, any amount of radiation that you get from any type of medical procedure could technically, theoretically cause future cancers. 
the other part of that answer that's also yes is yes over the years um, I can speak you know as as being within the Department of Radiology they have spent a huge amount of effort and thinking in terms of how we can always reduce the radiation exposure on these scans for the uh, and still have the same maximum benefit in terms of the uh, quality of the scan so both things are happening simultaneously but I will say that generally speaking the amount of radiation that you're getting in those scans is is really quite small um, compared to you know everything else that's going on and everything that we do in medicine is a cost benefit you know there's nothing uh, surgery has risks to it embolization procedures have risks to it uh, scan has risks to it, but you know we have to deal with the the main cancer that you're dealing with right now, and it's and the, and the importance of having good information about what's going on within your body and and um, how to help uh, change management based on that. I think supersedes the very minimal risk that you get from from the CT scan. It's a it's a totally different scenario for a person who you know doesn't have cancer, for instance, and is just getting a, a screening CT scan. We essentially don't do that because that that the risk there supersedes the benefit but for uh, most patients with cancer it's the opposite got it uh just a few minutes left maybe one or two more questions michael says does every neuroendocrine cell even non-cancerous in our bodies have somatostatin receptors yes um they all uh, typically have somatostatin re receptors but cancerous cells like many other things kind of overexpress and, and overwork. So that's where we use that as the, as the benefit for the treatment. Got it. Thank you for that. And thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael, for your question. Danielle says you mentioned multi-phase MRI for PNET. Is that multi-phase how abdominal, uh, abdominal MRI is typically protocoled or would we see something specific in the order regarding it being multi-phase? I'm glad that question was asked because um, no, that's not a standard in, in the net community. It is a standard, we all know and appreciate that, but outside of larger academic centers, I would say that it's not as well appreciated by uh, community oncologists or um, radiologists as well. Yes, you would see that in the, um, or it has to be ordered specifically that way. If it's not ordered that way, you can still continue to use contrast, for instance, but not in that, looking at it in a multi-phase. And that's what's really important. We see it all the time of uh, scans coming from um, outside institutions that we review and they don't have that. And it's very, very hard to compare lesions when you when you don't have that information. So I would definitely advocate for that um, if your doctor doesn't. Got it. And probably our last question about PRT. Fred says, is there any indication that PRT could be harmful to a patient with chronic heart disease? No information that I'm aware of that it would do that, no. Got it. Uh, and lastly, folks, I just wanted to uh, call out, I lost the the comment, but it was our friend Tom, friend of the foundation, who was speaking to Leslie, who was our, our, our newcomer that we welcomed. Yeah, there it is. Uh, this is just a part of the community that I love. I'm seeing it here in the comment section. Tom added a link and says uh, to Leslie, here's a guide to lingo and acronyms related to NETS uh, that is available on carcinoid.org, the CCF's website. Uh, so see, we're always trying to help. And if we can't jump in, uh, the community will. So that's a good place to start, Leslie. I see other people telling you welcome. So I want to reiterate that. But I, I love that um, that we, people chime in and, and give you helpful information like that. Because as we talked about with Dr. Mentor earlier, like we, we can dive in a little deep, a little fast sometimes. And, you know, medical jargon can be over a lot of our heads. Acronyms run wild. So uh, hopefully that will help. The more you know, uh, the better that you can approach this. Uh, Dr. Mentor, thank you again. It was so good to see you and I appreciate your time. And I can tell all the, the guests do as well. I'm seeing a lot of heart emojis being flooded into the Facebook stream and everybody's saying thanks so much. I appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate this interaction so much. And, and thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. And thanks again, as always, for you at home, you folks for joining us. And we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. And uh, again, I'll reiterate, please reach out to CCF at carcinoid.org or here on the Facebook page, you can send them a private message if you have any further questions or follow-up questions that you didn't get answered. Thanks again, as always, to our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without them, this program wouldn't be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thanks for watching. And please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.